Hello folks, welcome to episode 72 of Snakes and the Fat Man. Snakes and a Fat Man, we're huge supporters of diversity. We're proving that point here by having our first ever boa breeder as a sponsor on the show. Boa Affliction has been around since 2010, and when they saw the VPI T positive gene, they immediately shifted their focus and decided to make not just visually stunning albino boas, but they quickly realized that the T positive snows and sun glows really stood apart from the T negative albinos that were available at the time. This original VPI gene has maintained its place in the market for the last 10 years and shows no sign of slowing down. Here's the thing. When you invest into your 401k, uh, a 401k for all you ball python people is a fund that you invest in for your retirement. But when you invest in a 401k, you just don't invest in Walmart. You invest in Amazon, Verizon, Bitcoin, blah, blah, blah. Uh, that, that's all we're trying to say here. 100% of your collection doesn't have to be ball pythons. Throw a few boas in there and be part of a different type of cool crowd. And when you do do that, invest with Kenny over at Bow Affliction. Great, no bullshit guy with an awesome website. And how in the fuck am I gonna say no to a guy who uses this chick in his promo picture? Can't do it, can't do it, I tried everything. Go check out Kenny today at BoAffliction.com. Sticking with my supporting of diversity, I actually hired a millennial to handle all my social media, but I had to fire him because he, he didn't show up for work. So I'm just going to leave this picture up here for a little while longer. All right, guys, we're going to talk some uh, herps dates right now. But before I do that, I just want to say congratulations to uh, Lori Gibson, who is opening up her own little shop down there in uh, Bryan. And of course, if you guys are anywhere near or around Bryan College Station area, uh, make sure you go see the Herp shop. OK, it's a really fucking cool place. Of course, if you're in Bryan or College Station or surrounding areas, you probably already know. But go fuck into the shop, man. All right. So what we're doing now is uh, let's talk some show dates on March 5th and 6th. They're going to be in New Orleans, Louisiana. Look at this. A home show. March 12th and 13th in Bryan College Station. You see what I mean? It's like two cities, like a dash in between each other. I don't, I don't fucking know. But either way, they're going to be there March 12th and 13th. They're going to be in Slidell, Louisiana on April 2nd and 3rd. They're going to be in Beaumont on April 9th and 10th. Look, they're heading all the way down or up or sideways to Temple, Texas, April 16th or 17th. And uh, they're going to be in Austin on April 23rd and 24th. And then they're going to be way, way like eight hours away in Amarillo, Texas on May 14th and 15th. Listen, if you guys have any more questions, uh, 
about the Herp Shows, just fucking email Sean and Lori. Uh, go over to herpshow.net and fucking let them know what an awesome job they're doing. And uh, tell Lori, uh, say congratulations, man. This is a big move for these guys. Fucking this is where the big boys play, man. So there's something I want to discuss this episode, and I want to do it without sounding like a dick. Because I understand that people go through some hard times in life, right? But here's the deal, and I know this is going to come off as definitely sounding a little cunty. But the reptile community, especially the Instagram reptile community, has got to stop throwing these fundraisers and fucking lives to help every down-on-his-luck fucking asshole that lost his fucking job or can't afford his normal bills. Now, I'm not saying there's not worthwhile fundraisers to donate to, okay? If somebody has a serious medical issue, or if somebody, God forbid, loses a spouse or their child, or if they lose their house in a fire or a flood, yes, donate to those all day long, okay? I have and I will continue to donate to charities like that and and to offer, that actually offer help to people that have lost everything. Okay, U.S. Ark, where they actually fight for everybody's rights to keep reptiles. Again, all day long, I'll donate to that. Herp's Family Fund, where they help out the people who have been through a lot of the, uh, the, the things that I've listed above. Yes, fucking every day and twice on Sunday, I'll donate to the Herp's Family Fund. But for these fucking people that just lost their job or they're behind on their fucking bills... What the fuck, man? Maybe, just maybe, you shouldn't have spent five grand on fucking snakes if you're potentially homeless after missing one or two paychecks. And every one of them are like, well, I didn't even know that so-and-so no-name breeder was throwing this fundraiser for me, and I fought it tooth and nail. Yeah, but, but in the end, you always take the fucking money, don't you? What I do love is that the people who are actually running these fundraisers that they call, uh, they actually are learning the hard way that their shitty snakes are not worth anything near what they bought them for, okay? Oh, you mean that somebody doesn't wanna pay 600 bucks for your fucking powerhouse mail? That's a yellow belly, fire, pinstripe, possible head ghost? No, you don't fucking say, do you? Hmm fucking idiots. And and then you always have these miserable fucking Moffats that lost their job on the same live and they're like giving their sob story. They're like, well, what I'm going to do is I'm going to sell my entire collection because I have to take care of my family. Nothing means more to me than my family. I'm going to take care of my family and sell these snakes on Morph Market, but nobody's buying them. They've been up for two and three months. Nobody seems to want my pinstripe possible head hypos. Huh? Who would have fucking thunk it? Okay, you fucking idiot. And even if these fundraisers work, okay, and they raise the thousand or twelve hundred dollars that this guy needs to pay his rent or not get kicked out of his house, what's it really buying him? It's buying him a month that you spent your time raising a thousand or twelve hundred dollars for him just for him to lose his house the next month because that's what happens every fucking time wasted time and wasted money that's all these things are imagine what that thousand or twelve hundred dollars could have done if it was donated to somebody who had a real medical emergency or if it was donated to somebody in the community that lost their home because of a fire or a flood. Or imagine if fucking you donated that 1200 bucks to US Ark. I'm not being a dick here, okay? I, I realize that people need help every now and then. But the term fundraiser has lost it, its fucking meaning with these fucking Instagram lives. Stop calling it a fundraiser, okay? Call it the, uh, the, hey, we're trying to raise money for this fucking degenerate loser who spent his life making bad decisions and we have to pay his bills now show, okay? How about you get off your fucking ass and do whatever it takes to take care of your fucking family? Sell every animal you fucking have. Take the job at McDonald's. Take the job at Walmart. Fucking McDonald's workers are making $20 an hour right now. 
Don't rely on other people who odds are also a paycheck away from being homeless to help your fucking lazy ass out. Listen, there are legitimate causes to donate to, okay? I don't want the takeaway from this segment to be I'm anti-donation. I'm very pro-donation, okay? When it comes to people that have lost their houses or had medical emergencies or, you know, lost a, a family member. I'm very pro-donation. But I'm not going to help out some idiot that lost his job because he spent the savings that he should have had if he lost his job on ball pythons because he had some dickhead pipe dream of becoming a breeder, okay? If you can't afford the animals, don't get the fucking animals. If you're a paycheck away from being homeless, don't spend twice that paycheck on a fucking snake, okay? Just use your fucking head, man. And if you have any reptiles that are worth a shit, they will sell. Okay? Stop being low-end. Fucking get shit that matters. And you know where all the shit that matters is? Morph Market. Two weeks ago, Morph Market launched NFS 1.0. Today, you can use Morph Market to manage your whole reptile collection. Show off your favorite not for sale breeders and holdbacks in your store page gallery. Tag for sale animals with their parents and skip those fucking dumbass questions about could I see the father? Could I see the mother? Yeah, 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 I, I don't think that's gonna work. I, I think that you're still gonna get the fucking annoying, shitty, fucking dumbass questions because uh, probably uh, at least 10% of the people looking at your animals are fucking dumbasses, right? They can't afford it to begin with, but they're just there to waste your time. I think that you're not gonna get rid of those. I mean, this may, uh, may cut down on the dumbasses, but I, I think that there's still gonna be a dumbass contingent that asks stupid questions. Coming very soon are offspring pages, which will let you show off your breeding history of clutches and litters. Kind of like a throwback to the old Ralph Davis uh, days where he would put his clutch records on his website and you could just check out an animal's history for fucking, uh, I don't know, years and years, right? Uh, also, Morph Market is about to launch an industry event system. And this one is pretty cool. I said the other day to John, I was like, you know what you should do? You should probably introduce an industry event system, okay? Lo and behold, look what John did. Uh, this will further unify our community and answer questions like, what expos are happening near me? Who is vending at Tindley Park? Where are they in this huge giant room? I can't find them. Who could sell me a carpet python here? What do the parents of these animals look like? What else could I learn about this seller that makes me want to buy from them? I got an idea. If you want to learn things about the people that have been on this show, you could just go back and listen to the Snakes and the Fat Man episode where we've had said breeder on. We've pretty much interviewed all, all the people that matter, right? What other animals can I bookmark to make a follow-up purchase after the show? It's pretty cool. I gotta tell you, John took the idea and fucking ran with it. Events will actually be launching in advance of Tinley Park, NARBC, which is barely three weeks away. So, and they, got, they, got some, they got their work cut out for them. If you go and visit the Morph Market booth at Tinley Park, you could view an actual demo and you could tell John what you think about it. How great is that? In the meantime, Get your ass over to MorphMarket.com and become a fucking member. I've been telling you this for years now. Become a fucking member of Morph Market. Hey guys, it's Justin at Canova. So in the past few years, Canova's become the top source for amazing ball pythons. Now Chris tells me, Justin, it's time to give back. So we're sponsoring the 15 minutes of Lane to support the new and upcoming breeders. So jump in here. Let's hear your ideas. Let's hear your thoughts. 
maybe you can turn your 15 minutes of lame into 20 years of lame, just like I did. If you want to be the man, you got to beat the man. Whoa! So bring it. 15 minutes of lame! All right, everybody. On this week's 15 Minutes, I have the other Asian guy, Patrick Chung of Dragon Soul Reptiles. What's up, brother? What's going on, Chris? What's going on, everyone? You're, uh, you're, you, you know, you're, I mean, who is it now? Bob Vu, Harry Wang, and you. Three of me. Yeah, I guess. Yeah, I guess. I, I can't think of any anyone else, to be honest with you. Um, <laughs> fucking funny. Uh, well, anyway, um, you, you know how this goes. I'm going to give you 15 minutes. You just pimp your shit and uh, get everything out, and we'll uh, we'll go from there. We'll just go over a few uh, standard things, and then, uh, you know, we'll, we'll take it from there. Uh, I'm going to give you 15 minutes on the clock starting now. Let's do it. So, all right, what's with the, what's with the name, man? Um, so, you know, the big thing is Seoul is um, the capital of Korea. Um, and, you know, I wanted to spell it a little different and put a little twist of the Korean that, you know, that, you know, taste that I have. Um, and of course, you know, dragon is definitely my favorite reptile if it was ever true. Right. Um, so that's where the name came from, you know, and, and I didn't give it too much thought, I guess, you know, it's not super fancy, but, you know, to me, I think it represented, you know, who I was and was good enough to roll with it, you know, so. Yeah. No, I'm gonna give you a fucking nine on the name. <laughs> I, I I like the name. I mean, you could, because you could have did, you know, PC reptiles. Yeah. Or fucking Patrick's reptiles or yeah, uh, yeah. Illinois reptiles. reptiles. Yeah. 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 Fuck yeah. that. Uh, but but I I like the name. I think it's cool. Um, now how long have you been doing this? It's been about a year and a half, Chris. So I'm I'm very okay. new. Yeah. So you yeah you're seriously new. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Have you even had clutches yet? I had my first clutch. I had um it was a black pastel Mojave. Um and I actually got that one as almost an adult or almost ready to breed. And it's fairly a cheap snake, but I wanted to try out and give that, you know, run of breeding or going through that process. So I had it and I paired it up with the leopard clown. So I made some heads out of that and I had some good ratio. Um cool. sold all the ones I didn't want and I held back two females that I actually wanted to hold back. So yeah. All right, cool. Is it a uh, Barnhart Black Pastel? No, it's not, man. Ah. Uh, you know, unfortunately, you know, I got the <laughs> okay. snake for like, dude, I think $200 or something, Chris. Gotcha. Was, okay. You know, All right. Man. I definitely yeah, made but... my money back, I think, off of that clutch at least. Or yeah, yeah. I mean, and that's actually nice that you were like, hey, I'm going to try it with one first instead of getting 50 fucking snakes and all at once saying yeah. I'm, I'm going to breed them all and, and let's see i'm going to have 30 clutches my first year um all right so so that's that's i mean you're relatively i mean you started during the pandemic basically yeah man yeah yeah okay. dead in the middle of it i think yeah and is was that because you needed a new source of income or you just needed a new hobby well, I, I've, I've always been into animals. I love taking care of the animals. I have a big saltwater fish tank downstairs. So I'm a big saltwater hobbyist as well. Had dogs all my life, right? You know, reptiles as well, you know, turtles, fish, you name it, man, freshwater. But it was kind of funny because during the pandemic, um, I was deeply involved in corals and I'm fragging those. And I don't know if you know so much, but, you know, yeah. high end corals, you can actually frag them like like trees. Right. And then you right. can, you know, sell it. Um, it wasn't doing so good, but somebody actually, you know, mentioned ball pythons or, you know, snakes in general, like Burmese and retics in a fish store that I was in. And, you know, he was into fish as well. But and this guy really sold the idea. Well, Chris, I'll tell you that much, man. And um, he ended up selling me some of his snakes, which I regret buying to this day. But, you know, everybody has their way in. Right? What was this? Uh, was this Mark Petro sober? <laughs> no, 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 no. Um, I don't even want to talk about his name. He's not even on the social media platform, man. But he sold me the idea so well. And then right. I kind of took it and did the research in the back end, which got me really thinking, you know. And, and I was like, you know what? This is really, really cool. You know, it's not mm -hmm. like breeding a German shepherd to a German shepherd. You can actually make new combos, you know you know the space it takes to make profit or or you know maintain these animals is very you know um 
good compared to other animals too right you oh know, yeah 50 dogs is not the same R- as, right as, as having 50 ball pythons yeah right? man, i mean so um all right cool well how, how many ball pythons do you have right now i think i'm up to about 40 now so oh jesus still, okay all right yeah so still, it's still a, small it's still already small, you know, yeah still, it's already a problem all right yeah 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 um, definitely man like so, i gotta fill the tubs in the back right like you get it and you're like dude i gotta get 40 and then right. i'll go from there right and, you know, right right until, until you get the new rack and yeah. then you're like oh and i gotta fill 80 you know it, i gotta, it's, I gotta it's learn all... how ozzy kind of makes that cut off chris and kind of sells off whatever and then doesn't keep yeah. expanding i gotta pick that up too but yeah, yeah. i mean uh, because ozzy's collection is relatively small comparative to you like know Billy, somebody like, like will yeah. banks, will Billy, banks Dustin, yeah. you know right, um right so all right cool so so you know i'm gonna ask you've only been in it for a year and a half how much money have you put into it so far probably about sixty thousand seventy thousand man <laughs> sixty or seventy <laughs> fucking thousand dollars <laughs> fucking i made months. i made a whole 200 back bro <laughs> <laughs> 18 months to make two hundred dollars. Seems like it keeps getting worse too, Chris. Like I just <laughs> been to, I just went to, and I met Antoine there too. But I went to um, Justin's facility, right? Canova. Right. I'm part of his Patreon as well. So, dude, I I went over there. I'm like, man, this is not getting any better, huh? This yeah. is just man, the crazy it, stuff just keeps coming, right? So now, so how old are you? I'm 36. Okay, all right, all right. So you're, you know, you know, you're a decent age. What What's your day job? I'm a IT project manager, so okay. um, yeah, you know, I do a little so, project. So you management. got a legitimate job. It's, it's yeah, not yeah. like you're a beggar, you know. At nah, Walmart. Nah, you, nah. You I don't know, think. Point. Yeah, you need definitely something to keep you steady until this <laughs> picks up or even get back to break even point, Chris. You know, like it's it's a grind, man. Well, now, all right. So, <laughs> so <laughs> I mean, so you you said you made two hundred back, right? Two hundred dollars, yeah, man. That's just, I mean, that's horrible. Like, it I, is, man. Like, I'm surprised you have Asian parents and they let you do this. Because they, they got to be, your father has to look at you like my father looks at me. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> when I tell Dude, him. Dude, you have to pick snakes, huh, son? Mm, okay. Yeah, yeah, I'm going to do snakes, you know. Snakes, huh? mm. Yeah, they're going to be like, oh, that, that world's first is really paying the bills, <laughs> isn't it, son? You know? Right, <laughs> right, yeah. yeah. Like, I definitely yeah. get that part, yeah. They're not so supportive. Even my wife, man, she's like, if you have to mess with rats, snakes, really, you know, that's what you choose to do, you know? Yeah, it's like on top of it, at least with the fish, you weren't bringing in animals to kill every week, yeah. right? Like, like yeah. uh, and, and, it didn't and she probably as much, you know? <laughs> well, she, yeah, and she didn't have to worry about fucking frozen rats in the freezer, you know? Yeah. Like, fucking, yeah. like, what, what are you doing to me? Yeah, um, man. So, all right, so fucking 60 grand, Jesus. Okay, but but you at least have a steady job. So if all this went to shit tomorrow, you'll still be fine, right? I mean, You're yeah, in a way, yeah, off. yeah, definitely, yeah. right? But, you know, like the way I see it, Chris, if I just mess around with small chunks, you know, or small lower end animals, I think mm. it's going to be actually worse, you know, for the time that I put in. So the reason behind it is I started with a hundred, two hundred dollar snake. Now I'm buying six thousand dollar, you know, female right. snake from, you know, uh, Billy, Justin, you know, you name it. Right. Wazi, you know, the, you know, and, and those kind of kind of set me up for a better, you know, ground, you know, battleground compared to, right. you know, against the industry versus, you know, doing small or lower end, you know, animals. So that's well, doing doing the small and the lower end animals can work. But if you do a lot of them, you, yeah. you know, like. I'd rather produce one ten thousand dollar snake, yeah, than twenty five three hundred dollar snakes. You know, I think I'll lose just... that passion, Chris. You know, so I want you know I'm definitely I want to do something that's interesting and and you know actually looking forward to what I produce. So it definitely costs, but you know hopefully I can make some money back, right? You know, um, to your point. <laughs> well, well, just with the the stuff you got there, theoretically you could make sixty grand a year back in no time just just yeah. with the amount of space you have available so yeah um so all right i'm i'm, I'm not even gonna rip on you that much fucking because you know i mean when when i heard 200 dollars, i gotta admit i was just like whoa, whoa dude wow, that's yeah, yeah that's that's a little bit worse than i normally hear but yeah but I'm, I'm, I'm <laughs> but you definitely honest seem like too. you got a plan you know yeah mm-hmm. oh. it um, takes at least two to three years too i think you know and i'm sure you have 
you know, experts on the show, Chris, but, you know, you need to hold back certain animals that you aim for, which will be good money if you sold them. And you right. have to kind of get out of that rhythm, you know? So, yeah. Oh, I'm yeah. On the yeah grind, you you, you the definitely grind. can't. You can't chase the dollar and then you can't chase the person. Yeah. Man. You know, so like yeah. Ju Justin's going to put out, you know, whatever the fuck <laughs> Justin's going to put out. You can't be like, I'm going to be the next guy to do that. You'll always lose money if yeah. you, you know, yeah. if you're yeah. doing that. So, um, all right, now now let's just talk some sponsors here. Let's uh, Reptichip. Do you use Reptichip? Yes, I do. Hundred oh, percent. There you Love go. It, fucking Reptichip guy. Fucking support I like that. JT too as a person, man. You know, awesome. Yeah. Yeah, he's fucking incredible. Um, mm -hmm. uh, let's see, Justin. Obviously, you're part yep. of his Patreon. VIP Patreon. You know, monthly, man. You know, love the dude. I met him. I ha love every conversation with him. And I also have a couple snakes from him too, and those are double head clown pies. There, nice. They're pretty okay. powerful right. females, man. So, all right, good. So, so, oh yeah. man, you're fucking shaking and moving. Uh, <laughs> Morph Market, are you on Morph Market? Yes, I am. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. Already hit the trifecta. Fucking. I, I think nice. that's it. Now, now you're about to beat me up after this. Yeah, I feel yeah, like. yeah I'm totally gonna beat you up now. <laughs> uh, have you ever vended at a herp show? No, I have not. Oh. Uh, they're not oh. up here yet though right they're more in in texas area and cali right now correct they're, or, they're, or they're more, more south. down south they're, yeah, they're definitely yeah. more down south so that's my excuse so so i'm not even going to give you an f you from her from her because because theoretically i mean you could travel down there you know once a month but they should have one in chicago chris you know they they i, I don't think they're gonna go that far <laughs> up but but if they do um, i'm hoping to see you there Got um it. sd design do you use them I wish, man, but you know the price tag is a little high, so I think I need to work my way up to use SD Design. But I follow his work. I love the work that he did with Canova and some of the other Nava, I think as well. And then right. I follow him, you know, and watched you know your episode with him too. Um, but yeah, you know, I don't have the write-off amount, you know, to afford him yet. Well, you said some nice stuff about him, but Blake still gives <laughs> Patrick a big fuck you. <laughs> um. All right, now I you never bought a snake from Bo Affliction either, huh? From Kenny? Nah, nah you're about to get from, me on that one too. No, Ken, no Bo Kenny is another Asian guy, so I don't know how they say "f you" in Asian, but Kenny gives you a big fucking <laughs> fuck you. Gotcha. Right? Okay. Um, okay. Sea serpents. Do you have a rack or a incubator from them? I ha actually have an incubator right here. You can see that's from Sea Serpent. Oh, that's no. a small one. And Chris I have a hatchling rack too um, downstairs that I quarantine all the snakes before they come up here. So that's, I have a sea serpent rack too. That's fucking awesome. Chris does not give you an FU. Fucking beautiful. Now, um, do you have any any cages from Focus Cube Habitats in there? <laughs> no, I don't no. have any animals to keep them in. <laughs> so no. But, you know, my wife will kill me, man. Any more that I bring in, any live animal, reptiles, anything, plants, she doesn't care, you know? I'm at the max, man. So. Uh, yeah, yeah, I think that um, Ashley and Steven will not give you an F you because they understand the situation. Yeah. So yeah. Uh, <laughs> so, so it's pretty cool. But, but um, all right, well, you only got like two F U's there. That's great. Man. They're pretty good, oh, right? Yeah, yeah, you did fucking awesome, man. Yeah. Um, so at the end of the day, what's your huge project that you got going on this year? This year, I want to make some, if I can, make some good visual clowns to hold back female-wise or males and also clown pies, man. Those two, the other desert ghost and other stuff, I think you will still need a year or two to cook, you know, in the background mm -hmm. or, or mature. But yeah, that's my first step, man. Hopefully make some good looking clowns and clown pies. Now, are you basically just working with you with what you have, or is the temptation still there constantly to just pick up something new? I mean, after all, you did put sixty thousand dollars into this. What's another ten, right? Yeah, dude, seriously, it just it just doesn't stop, Chris, and and yeah. it has to be a, a line that you stop. So I'm I'm right there right now of saying, okay, I gotta allocate certain amount a year or something because I know you know my return on investment is not coming right away. 
but at least right kind of limit myself so i diversify my portfolio per se or you know there's stocks there's real estate there are other things you should invest in as well so right well yeah, plus I'm you trying, got a you got a kid you just got, had a kid yeah man that too so, i just had a newborn so that that bill is not even here yet you know so that's yeah. a good push man i could just imagine your wife just shaking her head at you and you're like, honey, yeah. I promise we're going to make a hundred thousand yeah, dollars. We're going to make, yeah, we're going to yeah. make it. Yeah. We're going to make it. Bob oh, Vu's doing pretty good, right? He's doing pretty good. Bob Vu is crushing it right now. <laughs> yeah. If anything, he's that the dude guy. Is killing it, man. Yeah, you know, Bob Vu is killing it. So he's fucking, it, man. um, yeah. man. And, and I actually think, uh, uh, Kenny is killing it too. So you could give her the Kenny reference too, even Got though it. Kenny gave you an FU fucking yeah, it. It's know, just. Right? He's he's killing it too. Uh, I, I even think uh, Harry Wang is killing it right now. I met doing. Harry and Bob Vote, you know, at the show, man, and they're mm. both stand up guys. Great person in general as well. They do have some great things, you know. Yeah. But I'm twice as tall as them, so you know, hopefully, I can do <laughs> twice as good. Seriously, too. I'm you are full grown, size. Right? I'm full grown Bob Vu, man. Right. <laughs> Hey, got to throw some jokes out there. Full grown Harry Wang, you know, oh, full grown it. Jet Li, man. You better watch out. I'm six foot one, man. You know? Oh shit, six one. Yeah, you are the yeah. tallest Asian ever. Fucking yeah, man. So. Oh fuck. Hey, hey, yeah. You ended it on a fucking good joke, man. Because uh, you hit your fifteen right there. <laughs> Sounds good. How could people get in touch with you, Pat? I'm on Instagram. You know, not on YouTube yet, but but on Morph Market, but mostly Instagram, man. You know. Um, I'm trying to put good content out there, you know, bear with me. I'm not, you know, like you said, number one in the beginning, I just got started, but I'll definitely, you know, keep everyone updated with the journey. So, and it's yeah. all, uh, it's all dragon soul reptiles, right? Dragon soul reptiles. Yep. And every, you're not every, on Facebook every... either. I am on Facebook. Yeah. Oh, are you? Yeah. Oh man, I got a friend you on Facebook. It's so much easier to contact you there. Yeah, yeah, I'm on Facebook <laughs> too. Yep, Facebook. I have a YouTube account too, Instagram. I have TikTok, but you know, mostly I'm on on Instagram. I'm trying to right. okay <laughs> get my quality up before I focus on social media. I got to have some good stuff to put out. I right? hear you. You don't want to be one of those people, man. Yeah, you know, that are just like I'm going to tell you what to do, even though I've been doing it for three <laughs> months. You know, so yeah, um, yeah. So, but uh, Patrick, thank you so much for taking the time, man. I appreciate it. Thank you, Chris. All right, everybody, Patrick Chung from Dragon Soul Reptiles, man. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, children of all ages, snakes in the Batman proudly brings to you. It's new breeder segment, 15 minutes of life! Alright, I have a couple of questions for anyone trying to run a business in the reptile industry. Do you ever feel like you're held back by a dated or detailed image? Are you sick of competing on price or convincing people to buy your fucking animals? Are you ready for a change, but not sure where to start? Stewart Design guides ambitious companies to discover and share their meaningful difference and empowers them to reach their greatest potential. If you've been listening to me for a while, you probably know my man Blake Stewart at Stewart Design. If not, I'm certain you've seen the waves they're making within the industry. They've worked with the biggest and baddest players in the game. Stewart Design rebranded ball python extraordinaire Justin Kabilka over at Canova. They also created the branch for Amos Reptiles, my boy Zach Nava, Garrett Hartle with Reach Out Reptiles, as well as many, many more. Not to mention the rebranding and all the work that Blake has donated to USR just because of uh, his love for the industry. Stewart Design helps take that dumpster fire shit of a logo you drew in Microsoft Word to a whole new level. Get your big boy pants on because this isn't a game. There are literally thousands of breeders and more coming out every day. So how the fuck will you stand out at Tinley or on Morph Market or at Daytona? Why should anyone buy anything from you when there are literally thousands of other dickheads out there selling the same stuff? If you want to run a real business and not some part-time fucking hobby, you have to stand out and look the goddamn part. 
If you give a shit about your business and want other people to give a shit about it, get a hold of Blake Stewart over at Stewart Design. Stewart Design is a professional branding agency. Just check out their website to see the list of major national and international awards that they've won. And besides creating kick-ass logos, Stewart Design also designs and prints everything you need to crush your next show so you don't look like another fucking reject. Business cards, stickers, flyers, table covers, banners, you name it, they got it. Visit sdidentity.com or email info at sdidentity.com to learn more. That's info at sdidentity.com to get started. Now, I've been a huge fan of this guy ever since I saw his documentary, The Mothman of Point Pleasant. He's an amazing storyteller, and when I saw that his company, Small Town Monsters, was actually launching a Kickstarter to pay for the uh, upcoming films of 2022, I just thought that now would probably be a cool time to have this guy on. If anyone is remotely interested in documentaries about cryptids like Bigfoot or the Jersey Devil or the Loch Ness Monster, then go check out this guy's movies right away. I mean, they're available on on YouTube, on Amazon, uh, on uh, iTunes, on Tubi. They're, they're pretty much available everywhere. Here's my one-on-one -on -one interview with Seth Breedlove of Small Town Monsters. All right, everybody. My guest today is the director of such uh, film documentaries as The Minerva Monster, The Mothman of Point Pleasant, and On the Trail of Bigfoot. And his company, Small Town uh, Monsters, just started a Kickstarter campaign about a week ago, and they're, they're just fucking crushing it. And uh, that's to film or to, uh, to fund the, uh, the films this year, which are going to include American Werewolves, On a Trail of UFOs, and The Jersey Devil. Uh, Seth Breedlove, what's up, brother? Hey, thanks for having me. Yeah, the, <clears throat> the Kickstarter's insanity. Uh, really? You guys hit the goals on the first day, right? And we hit the goal in the first 90 minutes of the no campaign. Shit. So right. it's been it's been a while since we had that happen. In the earliest days, because we've been running Kickstarters, this is our eighth. So we do it every year since the earliest days of STM, which all the way back to the Minerva Monster doc. But I mean, on that movie, we, we were trying to get 6,000. Just so, Actually, it wasn't even 6,000. We were trying to get 600 so we could fund production of the dvds and then we made like 6500 6500 on the campaign and then the next year it jumped up to like eighteen thousand, and then it just kept jumping from there i mean we'll go we should get at the current rate we should go over a hundred thousand this year so but, kickstarter was around in 2015 that's that's awesome yeah we actually yeah right at the beginning of 2015 kickstarter kickstarter was a part of our business model i guess you would call it i mean there's no model because we have no idea what we're doing year to year but but uh but yeah it was in there in the early stages of sdm it was a part of what we did well i, I was going to ask you did you actually try and get funding and, and what was getting funding for that first movie like when you just walked up to a rich guy and was like i want to make a movie about a bigfoot in ohio was he just mm -hmm. like get the fuck out of here and no uh, we, we we never uh, we've never spoke to anyone about funding actually. So other than Kickstarter is where we would, that's as close as we get to funding, but even, even our Kickstarters, um, you know, it's more of a pre-order campaign than it is, a uh, an actual, you know, like a typical crowd funder. Um, right. because I think, I think people get back more than they put in, in a lot of, a lot of scenarios when it comes to our Kickstarters, like the, the DVD levels and the Blu-ray level levels are actually cheaper than if you buy them direct from us even. Right. Um, so, so it's, it's more affordable to back the Kickstarter if you like what we're doing. So I always think of it more as like a way for us to directly sell to our fan base, the people that are into what we do um, while still supporting what we do for the remainder of the year. Right. So it's like, um, so I always think of it more as a, as a pre-order campaign, but no, there's never been a, um, We've never really sought traditional funding, mostly because there's really no reason to. Our movies don't cost what um, 
despite how some of them look like they don't cost what you would need to, to, to if you, if you were going to go with like a traditional funding model. Um, so we just, we just do it all um, through Kickstarter. And then by, by the middle part of the year, the end of the year, we're already making movies for the next year and we're usually out of money. So then that money just starts coming directly out of our pocket. So inevitably we, spend through everything we have and just start paying for it ourselves, um, which is not traditionally something you see with film and especially indie film. Um, right. But we, yeah, the few times where I've spoke to rich people or wealthy people who wanted to have a, some sort of like investment opportunity, it ended up feeling like we were going to get taken. So we just, we just have never done it. Yeah, no, no, I definitely, I, I backed the Kickstarter campaign and I want, I think there's a certain time that you could back it until are you going to have stretch goals on it or no? Yeah, we have. St- so the first two stretch goals are already reached. Um, we, we had, I think we had made the first stretch goal by the, by like the end of the first day. Really? Um, okay. Yeah. Yeah. And then the second one was a few days later. So now we're on to our third stretch goal, uh, which is like 110. If we can reach 110, we're going to turn the, on the trail of Bigfoot um, into like a, a dual box set with, um, with the uh, beyond the trail episodes that we're also going to be filming in Alaska while we're there. So you would get both those and the movie for the same price as the one disc. Yeah. I, but I, I, um, I want to go after that Jersey devil statue. That's the one. Uh, yeah. I think that, yeah, that that's, a, that's a cool fucking uh, level to have. So dude, I just got his, so I've been waiting on this, but he just sent me today. His, oh, that's, little, name? his little flatwoods monster. Yeah, one. Flatwoods yeah. Monster. That's, yeah. that's the one that we had last year. Um, so yeah, Gene does those each year for the campaign. And then you really can't get that version of the statue after the campaign's over. You get, you get like the, the duration of the campaign, which runs through through like the fifth or no, the third of March. Um, but once that's gone, like you, you can't find them again. So um, yeah, I don't remember what the question was. I just started talking but about genius. It's statue. all right. You, so, so uh, I mean, for, for the people that don't know who you are, because I think the majority of reptile people have seen your films. I don't mm. think they necessarily know who Seth Breedlove is. But if you right. ask him about a Bigfoot documentary or the Minerva Monster doc, I, I think they would know. So mm-hmm. um, for the people that don't know you, yeah. why did you start? Like, was this the intent to go after the monster thing right away? Or oh, did no. you try to go to like traditional film you mean, you mean You mean my life path? No. Uh, <laughs> no, not at all. No, I... Uh... I've done so yeah when I was a kid I wanted to be a filmmaker actually um that's how I met my director of photography was we were both into film and we we had talked about going to um uh like film school together and that kind of stuff but but we ended up not not taking that path to life he did go to film school but I did not I uh, went through a number of like odd jobs uh from you know like um repossessing homes and driving FedEx trucks to, to uh, freelance newspaper reporting, like all that kind of stuff I did. Um, but I came to, to this, to small town monsters. I kind of came uh, around to it just through a, an interest in the paranormal. And um, I grew up in a small town. I was curious about how <clears throat> the, the rural monster cases and UFO stories that I was into of impacted the towns where they took place. Um, I was much more interested in, in the cultural implications of like these stories than I was um, necessarily the monsters themselves. And so I put together a, uh, a, a, a book proposal back in 2013 and sent around to a bunch of different publishers and it was called small town monsters and they all rejected it. And, uh, about a year later I was with some friends and we had a, an interest in Bigfoot, uh, as a subject matter. And they were wanting to make documentaries cause they had just bought all this camera gear. And, uh, I said, well, let's just take the camera gear we have and make a, a documentary about one of the cases I'd covered in my initial book proposal and that ended up being nerve a monster. So we set out to make that movie thinking it would be like a little YouTube doc. And right. maybe, you know, a couple hundred people would 
watch it. But because of the fact that I was writing for newspapers, I had connections um, in the media around the state. And I was able to uh, use my connections uh, to get publicity for the movie before it had even come out. And people were, it was a slow news year or something, because for some reason, everyone just jumped on that story around the state. And it received a ton of publicity, uh, regionally anyway. And um, when it came out, it did well enough um, just in DVD and Blu-ray sales and and in local screenings that we were able to take the money we made on that and flip it into making our next movie. And then that one did, did well enough that we could do the same with the movie after. And, and so that's how it was. For the first, like, two two three years of stm all the way up through 2017 basically from 2014 through 2017 i was still working a normal job um <clears throat> you know while we were running this it wasn't until our mothman movie came out that we were able to really focus on small town monsters full time um but we had by that point we had already laid the foundation for the company as it right. would become right and, and the, uh, Mo- the mothman movie blew up right i mean i was really that's how yeah. I first heard it. <clears throat> that, that's how most people have heard of this. Yeah, the Mothman and Point Pleasant movie, people still watch it and talk about it too. Uh it I would say next to the Mothman prophecies, it's probably the most watched piece of Mothman related, you know, um film or, or media. Um, but yeah, we put that out in 2017 and it was like the number eight, eight best selling movie on Amazon by, by the end of the first weekend it was out and it was up against it. Like it ended up charting above Logan and rogue one, which were also oh, coming out around the same time. So it was a wild, a wild experience. It didn't make what you would expect a movie that was charting like that to make because we had, we'd never had that kind of success. And actually, our last movie prior to that had kind of bombed. So one of the things I was playing around with at that time was like, let's put let, let's put this up on Amazon and sell it at way under what we did the last movie. I think the movie before we were doing like two ninety nine, three ninety nine, something like that. And we put this one up for ninety nine cents. <laughs> and so like when it came out, like it did super well, but we didn't make a ton on it. Uh, but we made enough that we were able to focus much more heavily on filmmaking uh, as a career anyway but yeah it was a it was a well-watched movie and still is it, it's still i i think the interesting part of the stuff that you guys do is you really uh, the monsters are part of it but the the people i mean it's really centered around the people right so it's mm-hmm. uh I, I was just watching uh joe rogan where he, he called uh some of the bigfoot hunters uh basically unfuckable white guys right uh-huh. and watching your documentaries you, do, you they're really they're not those unfuckable white guys man they're they're those smart you, you know uh some of them are doctors uh mm-hmm. they're they're relatable i mean you you really go after the uh the, the people that i'm not seeing on like monster quest and uh you, you know all those history channels where where you could clearly see that their their witnesses are hired actors or or their experts are hired actors I'm, i don't really get that out of your your docs you know well i think too yeah i think too with television there's there's a there's a desperation especially amongst the paranormal cryptid bigfoot communities to be involved in television um and some of that comes from the fact that they're just older people who think that television equals like fame or something, but I, I don't think they quite, like, I don't, I don't think those people understand the fact that our, our films are probably more viewed than most of what you're seeing on network television these days. Um, like if you looked at viewing numbers, like 11 million people watched our on the trail of UFO series, as opposed to however many watch expedition Bigfoot, you know, like a right. good episode of expedition Bigfoot was charting somewhere around like 2 million, 3 million views. So, um, <clears throat> But I, I've been involved in this long enough that I know the people that I'm interested in and I want to sp- speak to, and I don't gravitate toward the. I'm trying to figure like a nice way to say this. Oh, I don't you, don't gravi- be, you don't got to be nice here. I mean, it's- I don't. I don't gravitate toward like the whack jobs or the 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 fame hungry Bigfoot crowd. It's like that's never. That's never been my scene. And I'm also like, I, I've been extremely skeptical when it comes to this subject up until the last year. Um, 
so I also tended to gravitate more toward level headed, you know, less, right. um, I don't know, people who, who weren't necessarily trying to push some sort of agenda. Um, that that's the, that's the crowd that I would, I would gravitate toward. So well, that's, that was going to be my next question actually, where, uh, you know, I, I was going to say, I, I understand you have to go into this with an open mind, right? Like even if you thought it was all bullshit, right? Mm -hmm. So something had to happen at some point in your career where something happened while you were filming, you, you had to be like, Oh shit, well, there, there might be something to this, you know? And what was that? Well, my, my path is weird because when I got into this stuff, I was just a hundred percent convinced right out of the gate that Bigfoot was real. Right. And then I actually, I actually slowly moved backwards um, as we made more and more movies, not necessarily because of the fact that I didn't believe the people we were interviewing, but because of the fact that I wasn't experiencing anything for myself and the number of questions as to what was actually going on just kept mounting as we made more and more movies. <laughs> Um, in 2018, I had an experience in southeastern Oklahoma while I was there with a, a buddy of mine um, looking for Bigfoot in a place called um, Area X. It's, um, it's in the Wachita Mountains, um, which is basically like a rainforest. It's an incredible place. But uh, we were there. We were camping like nine miles from any paved road down in this valley where people don't go because it's private property. Um, and in the middle of the night, like something threw rocks at our, at our tent and was screaming and laughing up on a hill. Um, and that kind of moved the needle for me somewhat as far as my, you know, thinking that there was actually a Bigfoot out there. I had dropped to like maybe 20% that these things were real, maybe 30% that they were real. Right. And after that experience, I moved up to like 70, 80. Right. <laughs> and then, um, this past summer I was in Minerva. We're, we're making a YouTube series out in Minerva uh, called the Bigfoot project. And we've experienced some stuff out there that really like defies logic. Doesn't make a lot of sense. And so um, we were out there filming an episode of our, our series. And uh, I saw an upright hairy creature running along a hillside. And then that kind of moved me to where I am today, which is like 99% that these things are real. I'm okay. only at 99. I'm not all the way to 100 just because what I saw was so fleeting, but I also know what I didn't see. And I didn't I didn't see a person. I didn't see a deer, which leaves not much. It doesn't leave a lot of room for what that could be running on two legs through the woods. Coming yeah, out. yeah, because all these people that say it, it's bears, I mean, I've you're not going to mistake a bear on its mm -hmm. hind legs for a Bigfoot. You, you know, I mean, I'm from New York City. And I fucking know that. You, you right. know, so uh, the, these people that dismiss it so quickly, you, you know, you tend to get fucking aggravated with. But um, but now now what about the other things like, like the Mothman, like the American werewolf? I, I mean, how are you in in scale of belief on those? Because you probably haven't seen those. And, and, and the thing that I think that that everybody has to understand is even if you go out to hunt Bigfoot, right? Um 99.9% .9 of your time is just going to be uneventful waiting, right? I mean, it's just. Sure. Yeah, I, I think there's a different approach I take to those other topics um, versus something like Bigfoot or UFOs. And that is that I really approach most other subject matter as folklore. And just on a personal level, it doesn't mean that I don't, you know, believe people's encounters or things like that but my personal approach is just completely different on something like mothman versus my approach on something like bigfoot um i don't know what that is accounting for what you account account for that because witnesses in any of those other subjects can be just as believable as bigfoot witnesses right um but the there's so some of those su subjects are so far out there uh and defy logic to such an extent that you kind of just have to assume that you're never going to know the answer answer to whether these things exist or not right um and sort of approach it find find your own way to dial into those topics emotionally because we make so many movies we make four movies a year um and then hours of of youtube content 
you I emotionally I have to be dialed into these movies or else they're they're gonna suck. Like we we you know, like it's I've got to find my emotional in to them. Um and for something like Bigfoot, it really is the actual search for the creature that it's one of the things that compels me most about the topic. Uh, likewise with UFOs. When it comes to Mothman, I'm not interested in people running around the woods looking for Mothman. I don't even know if people do that. Uh, but, but I am interested in the witness stories and how those uh, witnesses' lives were changed by, by their encounter and i'm interested in how the the rural communities where they live were impacted by those encounters as well so it's just a totally different you have to dial into it in a different way on each on each subject i find right well well and and when you guys finally make these movies or you know i mean you guys got a ton of shit on youtube right um Mm -hmm. What 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 do you use to film the movies versus YouTube? Like, do you just have some run and gun stuff that you use for the YouTube, you, you know, stuff? Or uh, um, you would think, but we actually we actually approach it. It's all the same stuff at this point. So we have all our own gear, um, which we've kind of accumulated over time, and so we actually are filming everything pretty much the same as far as gear goes. I would say there's definitely. You know, when it comes to, I mean, this gets into boring filmmaking minutia, but when it comes to like uh, a film project, I would rather film with prime lenses than I would zooms. Mm-hmm. Whereas I find something like our, our, um, the movies, we're, or the stuff we're making for YouTube or, or even the on the trail of stuff, we tend to film those with zooms. But when we're making a movie, I like to film with prime lenses. Um, especially when it comes to interviews so we can get a a more like cinematic look, especially when it comes to the legend movies. So like uh, Mothman legacy and Mark of the bell, Witch and skinwalker and that kind of stuff. We're definitely filming those in a different, it's a, it's a completely different mindset than what we bring to on the trail of, or the YouTube stuff, the YouTube and on the trail of stuff is shot very much run and gun in the moment film film what you can get whatever you can get you know uh whereas when it comes to american werewolves or the jersey devil movie we're going to be making this year those will be um much more um locked down a methodical look to them you know like a very specific cinematic sort of style that we try to try to get to the lighting and all that kind of stuff you can't do that you just straight up can't do that with with the on the trail of movies or the youtube stuff if we mostly because the youtube stuff is being made on like a dime um and and so the amount of time we have to dedicate to it isn't isn't doesn't allow for us to do like really intensive lighting setups but also just in general it's hard to get interviews shot in the woods with lighting like right. like most most of the time when we're doing that other stuff you we're filming it out out in the woods we don't we're not doing it in a studio setting at all um and you don't have the time to dedicate to to dialing in lighting and even sound like set sound we have to use whatever we have um at our disposal that we'll get a de- you know so we can capture decent audio but but do it quickly right. um because at the end of the day, we're putting out the same amount, probably more. We're we're putting out a comparable amount of productions um, <clears throat> devoted to the paranormal as most of your major television production companies, and those companies are working with millions of dollars. Right. Uh, where, whereas we're working with a few hundred thousand, if we're lucky. Right. Right. I, I was actually shocked that your initial goal on uh, on. Uh kickstarter was i think it was like 60 grand and i was like how the the fuck are they gonna make four movies on 60 grand you know so it's you know i'm glad that it's definitely moving up a little bit um Mm -hmm. i mean the the fact is that 60 grand a hundred grand you're still looking at four films weighing in in the neighborhood of like 20 25 a piece 20 25 grand a piece we also have to produce all the rewards we're making and then we'll make will make uh probably in terms of like the really heavily produced youtube content so like beyond the trail and the bigfoot project um and and on the trail of bigfoot the ridge which is coming later this year those 
those will total probably somewhere around 20, 30 hours worth of content on top of the films. And so we could, we could make a half million dollars and it, and it still probably wouldn't cover the, the money that we're, we're spending per year just because we would, we would find a way to increase the amount of output right. if we, right. if we were making that, we don't like to do things easily here. We, well, we're I, I, I was, ourselves. I was thinking that I was like, you know, when, when the goal was 60 grand, like I, I was thinking, even if it was a half a million dollars for movies, I mean, Seth may be fucking Uber driving on the side, you, you know, to make a little fucking cash because this is ridiculous. Like I've like, I don't understand how 60 grand could finance, you, you know, a YouTube creator per year, let mm. alone a company like you guys that are actually doing, you, you know, releases. Um, we don't, we don't make, Profit has has not been something that we focus on um, up to now. I, I'm I'm hoping at some point that is the case, but it doesn't really drive us. We are trying to grow year to year, um, and so for me, it's all been about investing. We we haven't we haven't gotten to a point yet where. I would say myself or anyone that works for me makes something that is equal to the amount of effort we have to put in. Mm -hmm. Um, I think we'll get there, but for, for me, it's always been how much are you willing to invest of yourself? Not, not monetarily, but how much, how much time and effort are you willing to invest with the knowledge that you're probably not getting it back and at least not equal to what you put in. Please excuse this brief interruption for a word from one of our sponsors. How fucking thrilled am I to have Focus Cubed Habitats joining the snakes and the fat man family. They are literally the best display cages that I've ever owned. I, I, I was a fan of this husband and wife team of builders from when they were putting out these amazing pieces of fucking art from their garage. Steven and Ashley have been keeping reptiles for years and as experienced keepers they understand how important your animals are in your life. Focus Cubed Habitats provide security and comfort for your animals while maintaining these insane, badass designs that everyone can appreciate. They give you the opportunity to make their home part of your home. You want options? They've got options. Every Focus Cubed Habitat is custom made to your specs, and you could choose from hundreds of options on their website. Too many options? Ashley and Steven have a huge selection of blog style articles and complete accessory fact pages on their website to help educate consumers about add-ons that will best fit their individual needs. Listen, at the end of the day, these fucking cages are showpieces. Every cage their focus builds will be the centerpiece of your reptile room. Hell, they could be the centerpiece of your fucking living room. If you have reptiles that you want to display, Look no further than Focus Cubed Habitats. You can follow them on Instagram, Facebook, and even fucking TikTok. Or just go old school and, and go right to FocusCubedHabitats.com and tell them that the fat man told you to drop them a line. Yeah, it, it, it's fucking nuts, man. Uh, you guys are really, I, I mean, I would consider you guys probably one of the bigger documentary film companies, right? I, or or I, at least I, you put out the most. I mean, in terms of the paranormal, where there's no one even in the same ballpark, but the, you know, I mean, unless you want to talk about, there's companies where they have multiple filmmakers and they're putting out, but I think those are distributors more so than a production company. I'm actually not even really aware of another production company that functions the way we do. The closest thing I have to compare SDM to is more of like an indie band or like an indie band model. Like it's, right. it's more in keeping with something like that where you're, you know, like you're, you're tour, you're almost like touring and there's a constant need to be driving the thing by performing. Um, the, 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 the closest I can think of when it comes to a production company 
would be trauma like trauma right. at the, yeah. at the, i mean still today but but especially at the height of like you know citizen toxic and all that kind of stuff their business model would be comparable to what we do <laughs> Um, but they were putting out far more than we are. And we're, we're kind of like focused on this one niche area. Right. So it's a little different from that, but yeah, I kind of always considered small town monsters, like the view askew of document, you know, documentary films, mm -hmm. because it, it, you know, you definitely do have that, that independent approach. I mean, you, you guys didn't have anything to do with that, uh, that Bob Lazar film, right? Like, like that was the one thing that I, I could compare it to really. No, because if we did, we would have we'd have way more money, you right? Know? Right. Like, like the 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 Bob Lazar movie made a a, a ton of money. Um, ditto with like pretty much any anything Corbell's made is has made a lot. I know I know a lot of it's gone to to Netflix, and that's a game changer. That would be a game changer for us if we could land a Netflix deal or something like that. But that kind of right. comes down to our distributor and the deals they're landing for us on their end. But, but saying the view askew, you know, the view askew stuff is. I mean, first of all, that's a that's a cool compliment. Just because I'm a big fan of Kevin Smith as a filmmaker, like I, I'm always fascinated by the way he he talks about filmmaking and the way he grew the company and everything. I would say, yeah, we're we're in that same kind of like we're fiercely independent too. We've had offers from production companies and distribution companies in Hollywood to be involved. Um, it, it's just that none of it ever played by our rules, so we're not really interested. I'm not really interested when I say we're. I just kind of include myself. I'm sure there's people that work for me who are like, "Why are we not <laughs> signing this Hollywood deal?" <laughs> uh, <laughs> But I, I, yeah, you you either play by my rules or I'm not interested is kind of how we I've approached. Well, that's how I approach life too. So, well, well, so. your guys' distribution company is is 1091, right? 1091. Yeah, and yeah, and they've been great. Like they they were a game changer for us. They came along at a point where we would have lost the company. Mm. Um, in 2019, Amazon sent us an email and told us they were they were going to start. Um, they were no longer going to allow unsolicited uh, documentary projects on their platform. And so unless you were with a major studio, you were done. And it just so happened that we just received an offer from 1091 around that same time for one of our movies. And uh, we had had other offers over the years. Gravitas had come to us a couple of times. I think we'd even spoke to the Lionsgate in the earliest days of STM. But all the money that was being kicked around didn't make what we made completely independently doing it. So it right. never made sense for me to sign with a distributor until right. that moment. And uh, I mean, it was a hard thing for me because I had to give up controlling all aspects of the release of our movies, which was something I had done from the earliest days. But if they hadn't come along when they did, we would not be here today. The company would have gone under that year because we basically got kicked off Amazon entirely gotcha okay and and well you guys does that say, does 1091 get you on amazon apple you, you know all the other streaming so, services so they get us on the streaming services and they shop us to to you know uh television and and movie studios and things like that um amazon is still uh not allowing most documentary work on free prime but you can find our movies on for for sale on prime we got to think like stm kind of grew into what it is today because of amazon right um the audience that found us most of the most of that audience found us initially on amazon and so when they essentially banned us from the platform at least from the free side of of Amazon, it did. I mean, it. I, I would assume we we lost a, a pretty good chunk of our our initial audience. I think we're growing again, but that's on other platforms like Tubi and now YouTube and things like right. that that we're we're starting to find a new audience. Yeah, yeah. How I found you on YouTube was I was watching an episode of uh, Unsolved on BuzzFeed, mm -hmm. and then you were on the next one because I think there was a Mothman thing on BuzzFeed, and then. Yeah, uh, it it came on to there. So so that was that was awesome. I you know I was glad I did because I've seen every one of your movies. I even watched that uh, Momo movie the other night in preparation. <laughs> yeah, for this. 
that's my baby, man. That that's a weird friggin' movie, and you gotta you gotta like be dialed into our our own particular brand of like insanity. But you gotta it's a it's a strange movie. It's a it's a it's a parody of the current state of paranormal television, and it's always also like a parody of the seventies drive-in stuff that we love. Right. Right. Um, but it's a it's a bizarre movie. Yeah, no, it, it was definitely your weirdest uh, one that I've seen. Yeah. Now, as far as release strategy, have you ever had movies released in, in a theater or has it always been just straight to DVD? I mean, anyone, any more anyone can release a movie in in theaters. If, um, if you buy, buy out the theater, right? Yeah, if you buy it out or if the theater is a smaller chain that's willing to show it, we we did that in the earlier days of STM. There was the uh, Boggy Creek Monster was shown in in select theaters. Um our distributor uh had initially talked about doing a theatrical release for Mothman Legacy and mm. and then uh didn't go that direction. So, um I've never cared. It's a blast to go see a movie. In a, in a theater, especially our movies, but I would rather kind of set up our own screenings and do them ourselves right. than I would see one of our films released theatrically. I also just don't think, I don't think our stuff would find an audience that way. Like, I mean, what is what are, what are the number, if you boil down how many people are into like cryptids and the paranormal, it's a, it's a niche audience and the audience would have to be willing to go to the theater in large enough numbers to make right. that worth time for a distributor and i don't necessarily see that happening because even something like the lazar doc i don't remember if that had a theatrical release. no that was maybe, actually maybe really, really I mean, limited right now released on netflix is similar to a uh yeah i mean not the experience but you know as far as numbers go i, I was surprised because that uh lazar flick was on netflix home screen for probably two weeks before you know, mm -hmm. before it was released. So, uh, yeah. you know, you're definitely going to watch that. I mean, a, a Netflix deal would, I mean, you guys would crush it on fucking Netflix. Um, yeah. That's definitely the, the, the thing to do. Now, um, it, do you have aspirations of going in and directing like a major motion picture for a Hollywood company? No. Um, no. And so in 2000, uh, 18, I became friends with Adam Wingard who made uh, Godzilla vs. Kong. Mm -hmm. And he had watched Invasion on Chestnut Ridge, uh, one of my movies on Amazon, and called me up one night. And him and I ended up talking. And he flew me out to Hollywood. And I hung out at Legendary, the Legendary offices while they were in pre-production on, on Kong vs. Godzilla. I... I got to go through the whole process of watching him work on Godzilla versus Kong over the course of like a year and a half and talking to him behind the scenes. And I saw, I got to see pre -viz on the, the battleship fight from Godzilla versus Kong, like nine months, nine, 10 months before the movie was released. And I, I was, I feel like I had a pretty good insight into what making movies in within the Hollywood system is like. And it, to me looks like a nightmare. It's a nightmare that Adam enjoys and he likes being a part of that um, system, but it takes a very specific kind of person to make that, that type of movie. And um, yeah, making a, especially like the big budget kind of stuff. I would, I would never have, an interest in that, but I don't even know that I'm interested in working within that whole system to begin with. I'm much more at this point, I'm much more interested in guys like Kevin Smith or um, the, the guys that work outside of, of Hollywood, Robert Rod Rodriguez, like the guys who do their own thing and make that work for them, like make that their career. Those are the guys that, that I'm, I'm interested like Richard Linklater is one of my heroes because mm. You know, like he made Dazed and Confused. Slacker, right? Been, yeah, yeah, Slacker, mm -hmm. Dazed and Confused. But he works, you know, like he kind of created his own studio and lives lives in Alt, uh, Austin. And like, it's it's just a, working within Hollywood has no appeal to me whatsoever. And big budgets are terrifying because you're going to have a boardroom full of people that kind of like dictate every decision you're making. 
And that, oh, yeah. That, yeah. that sounds like a step back into like medical billing territory, yeah. which is what I did. And I have no interest in going back to that. Yeah, no, I, I lived there for 12 years, so I get it. Uh, but also, um, I went to ILM. A friend of uh, my, my ex's was an animator, so we actually got to go into ILM. And I got to see uh, previs on one of the prequels uh one uh star wars and uh yeah you know i got to see you know yoda you know crawling through the uh uh the tube before he escaped and 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 ilm is is like massive right so it's mm -hmm. like it's it's this incredible thing and then when you leave you're like man i haven't i didn't see one guy filming anything <laughs> you yeah. know the, the whole day everybody was like you said working on computers and, and it, was, it was like a like a billing office you know and it yeah. was cool as shit to see it, but uh, I, you know, I, I kind of, uh, it, you know, I, I, I'm kind of like you where I'm into the, and believe me, I'm a fucking Star Wars sci-fi fan like you wouldn't believe, but, uh, but, I, but I definitely have a special place in my heart for the independent, you know, Kevin Smith stuff. Like anything Kevin Smith does, I'll watch. I watched that goddamn Tusk movie and fucking, I, th I think I paid to own it. And I, yeah. you know, so anything you do, I'll buy. He got you good. Uh, yeah, I, I've been that way for a long time, actually. Like even as a kid, I was, I was much more drawn to, to the indie stuff. I mean, I'm like you. I'm, I love, I love Star Wars and Batman movies and all that kind of stuff too. But as far as my own, the stuff that excites me creatively, it's, you know, it's Kevin Smith and. Robert Rodriguez and that kind of stuff. Link later. Well, um, and, and also like you've been around around the country filming pretty much, right? And yeah. where would you say is the place that embraces their history with a cryptid the most? Like, is it Point Pleasant in West Virginia, or is it somewhere in Alaska with Bigfoot? Like, where would be the place that 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 happens the biggest? Because I know Moth, that Mothman Festival, Jesus Christ, a lot of people descend on that fucking little town yeah. for, you know, a week or so. I, I'd say it's got to be Point Pleasant. Um, you know, I mean, obviously, you're not, not everyone in that town loves the Mothman story or the fact that the 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 town has a statue of the Mothman downtown. Um, right in the middle, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Every, every year when we do the Mothman Festival, we get people coming up to us telling us it's fake and like... I hope you're embarrassed to be here and like all this kind of stuff. We get, we get yelled at every time we do the festival, but, um, <clears throat> but as far as like a town that, that really knows how to utilize their local legend, it's gotta be, it's gotta be point pleasant. There's, there's a, you know, Falk, Arkansas, um, with the monster Mart and sort of embracing the legend of Boggy Creek, they've done it as well, but that's a town of like 700 people versus point pleasant, which is, you know, like 16,000 right. and point pleasant's just figured out how to do it. Like how to make it work on a, a on a tourism level. A lot of that has to do with Jeff Wamsley, the guy that runs the museum the and everything being, museum. yeah. Being yeah. so tied into it. And um, yeah, it's gotta be point pleasant. There's there's no one else that has figured that out. Maybe Roswell. I haven't been to Roswell. That's one of the towns where I know they've embraced, you know, their connection to the to the UFO subject, mm -hmm. um, and have made it work for them as well. So it's it's. But I haven't been there. So Point Pleasant for me, but Roswell is supposed to be up there at the top too. Yeah, I'm gonna visit Point Pleasant this summer, and I had a chance to visit Roswell. Uh, before covid but uh but i ended up not taking it but i heard you can't even go to where it actually happened now i mean you, you could go to like within 100 yards of that right and and, and it's just a field so i could yeah. take a picture of any other field and just tell people i've been to roswell and it's well that's good. the thing about point pleasant point pleasant has interest like visually interesting places to visit that are connected to the mothman because mm -hmm. you've got the it's at the confluence of like these three rivers it's it, you see go there and see that and then to go out to the tnt area where the where some of the initial sightings happen that's a cool place i mean it's creepy as all get out especially at night so it's a cool creepy place to actually go look for something right you know whereas sure i'm certain you know new mexico you're just staring at the at the dark sky at night yeah 
and meth heads, you know, so, and meth heads. so yeah. it's another thing. Um, now, uh, we're, we're really almost done here, but uh, do you feel that like basically cell phones have kind of ruined the the legend industry? Because right now y- you can't find somebody who doesn't have a camera in their pocket at all times. Mm-hmm. And yeah. I haven't seen really seen many, you know, Bigfoot sightings and many, uh, you, you know, UFO sightings since everybody's had a cell phone, you know. Mm-hmm. So did you <laughs> notice any type of hit, you know, that the industry took with that? No, I think it's it's booming. I mean, that's part of the problem is it's booming right now. Um, mm-hmm. But I think I think there's always going to be a group of people that want evidence. They want everything to be about evidence. Oh, you say Bigfoot's real. Well, show me a video of it or show me this or that of Bigfoot. But uh, like end of the day, I still think it's the stories themselves that, that make this stuff so fascinating. And and the the actual existence of something like a Mothman is secondary to how the Mothman story has evolved and changed over time and impacted the, the area and the, and the lives of the people that are connected to it. Um, there's, there's no way. Do I think Mothman is real? Probably not. Like, right. I don't think, I don't think there's actually a Mothman flying around out there. Um, that doesn't mean I don't think there's much more going on there than just people misidentifying birds or things like that. But right, like the story itself, not- right. The story itself is what's so interesting and, and, you know, like what that story tells us about ourselves. Um, it's like, it's, it has all the, all the facets of like any great story. Most of these legends do. And that's why people are drawn to them. It isn't necessarily the monsters themselves either. Like the monsters that, that grow in popularity, it doesn't necessarily have to do with that creature. I think it's the initial story. That's why Mothman is such a big deal. Mothman is a three act, this beautiful three act structured story. Uh, You know, you know, where you have, where you have these initial sightings that take place with these kids out in this, it's, it's got all the trappings of like your classic, like nuclear era uh, Godzilla movie or like any, any monster movie uh, from like the cold war era. But, it's, it's got this second act where everything starts to to heighten and then you've got men in black and you've got UFOs and all this stuff. And then you get the third act that culminates with the collapse of the Silver Bridge. That is why the Mothman story is so popular. Right. That's why the Mothman is so popular. It, it isn't necessarily that people are like, God, I really want to see this friggin' flying bat with giant red eyes. It's that it, it that creature is at the heart of this really amazing story. Yeah. And and so that's, yeah, that's my uh, rant. Well, and, and also uh, that uh, I, I think it was the Olympic Bigfoot uh, that I was watching. There, there's mm. that, it was that uh, Area X story that you were talking about before. The, those guys are actually, uh, they, they want to kill a Bigfoot, right? <laughs> like they, they yeah, want to kill see. To, to prove yeah, to well, everybody that it's, you know. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, it, it it sounds crazy, but but realistically, there's only one way you're going to ever prove to science that an animal exists, right. and that's by presenting a body, dead or alive. That's the only way science is going to accept the existence of one of these things. Showing them a photo isn't going to do anything at this point in time. Um, so you got to you got to present a body or a type specimen, as they would say, in in some form or fashion. It doesn't have to be the whole body. So their the NAWAC's goal is to to collect one. Like ultimately they want to present all the evidence they can in the way of casts and things like that. But, but the ultimate goal is to, to bring in a body and be like, look, these things are real. We've seen them. Here's proof. Shut up about it. Like, right. Right. <laughs> like to actually silence the, the skeptics and there's only one way to do it. And, and that's a body. So, yeah. I, I mean, I, I think if anything, that that's, that's the weirder story of this whole thing. It's like, you got these intelligent people mm-hmm. out there just ready to kill a Bigfoot. <laughs> I just yeah. think it's pretty funny, man. I, I think it's uh, it, it's an interesting concept because you, these aren't unfuckable white guys. These are clearly smart people that, yeah. that are up there, you know, uh, and, and that's, that's well, what I mean, they're doing with their lives. That, that group that group has more um yeah more degrees involved than 
than most college campuses. Like uh, there, there's a, a large, very, very intelligent number of people in that group. Um, and beyond that, I mean, a bunch of those dudes are, are military and like legit, right? Like military, Marines, Navy, they're the Air Force guys. They're yeah. high. It's, it's, it, it's a very intelligent group of people um, that are involved in that group. Same with, same with the Olympic project group. I mean, that's the thing that, Television would have you to believe that Bigfooters are primarily um, guys that live in their mom's basement, you know, who spend like a couple couple hours out in the woods each weekend. But um, that's that's kind of where we started with in this conversation was those aren't necessarily the guys I'm interested in. I'm interested in the guys that are that are equipped to be out there looking for something that everyone else says doesn't exist, um, yeah. and they still are willing to go do it. Well, you guys definitely pulled in the uh, the typical, you know, idiot witnesses in uh, Momo, because I mean that was that was pretty funny. <laughs> yeah. With you, you know, with, with the older guy sitting at his kitchen table, I definitely had fun with that. So, um, yeah. dude, thank you so much for taking the time to fucking do this. I, I appreciate you coming on, and uh, I appreciate you spending almost an hour with me. I, I know you're busy, so. How could people uh, help out small town monsters right now? Um, yeah, if you're into our stuff, you go on the Kickstarter and just look up small town monsters and you'll find us on Kickstarter. Uh, if you just want to watch our movies, you can do that on YouTube and Amazon prime. Some of our stuff's still on prime. There's no rhyme or reason to what stuff they're leaving up. There's not much. There's, I think one of the, on the trail of Bigfoot's is still up there. Um, maybe Mothman and Point Pleasant. So YouTube, Tubi TV, you can buy and rent our movies online on Apple, um, I, I, iTunes, Google Play, or you can buy physical copies at smalltownmonsters.com along with like merch and stuff if you want to support us in that way. Beautiful. Seth, thanks again, brother. I appreciate it, man. Yeah, thanks for having me. All right, brother. Take it easy. Boom. It's the first video ad in Snakes in the Fat Man history. Look at it. Look at it. That right there is the best coconut substrate on the fucking planet. Look at this right here. This is also the best coconut substrate on the fucking planet, but it's in a bag. Now this right here is the best coconut chip on the fucking planet. However, it's in a bigger bag. Brick, small bag, bigger bag, whatever. Reptichip is hands down the best substrate for your reptiles. It's the only substrate I actually use here at the Fat Cave. Why? Because it's the best coconut substrate on the fucking planet and I've been using it for years. And JT Tomlinson, one of my very best good friends, is the president of the company. Want to know something else that JT started? The Reptolution Apparel Company that gives 100% of the profits it receives back to the reptile community. There's always people and organizations in this hobby in need of some kind of help. And Reptolution is being proactive in giving to USR, Herb's Family Fund, anybody in the community that experienced some kind of tragedy, uh, JT, Reptichip, and Reptolution is there for them. You see anybody else being proactive like this? Let me answer that for you. No, you don't. Head on over to Reptichip.com and pick up a bag a block, a brick, a, a, a box even. They're doing boxes. Boxes of Reptichip now. Um, pick up a Reptolution shirt if you're feeling sexy. Uh, a, lot, a lot of fun stuff. They, they, they got it all there. Red Line Science, um, uh, tools, shit scrapers. They got everything. It's a one-stop shop, man. You can buy your reptile shit and clothes. Same place. Uh, again, go buy a brick, a bag, box a shirt, w whatever. Just get on it, reptichip.com. So thanks everybody for sticking around for this episode. I, I hope you enjoyed the conversation with Seth. Uh, we're actually trying to do more of this where we're trying to bring in people from outside the reptile industry, uh, filmmakers, musicians, uh, you know, possible chefs maybe, you know, just fun things to talk about besides reptile people every fucking episode because 
it, you gotta, you, eventually you're gonna get tired of it. Hearing the same fucking answers from the same fucking people. Uh, we definitely wanna reach outside the genre a little bit and have different type of people in as well as the reptile breeders. And the reptile breeders that we do have on, hopefully you'll see, you know, that uh, they're above and beyond and they're definitely in the top tier of breeders in the country. If you like what we're doing here, join us on Patreon. For five bucks a month, you could support the show. For 10 bucks a month, you could have access to like exclusive videos that are only on Patreon. Like uh, we have a video series called Shitting On, where I just shit on ball python genes and uh, soon ball python people. Uh, that's always fun. Um, we also have a new segment called It Doesn't Matter, where I talk to uh, breeders, mostly the guest here, uh, about just shit that doesn't matter. We, we put a list together of various topics and we compare those lists. And this week uh, I actually did a It Doesn't Matter with Heidi Dunlap from uh, Southern Star Reptiles and In Blue, uh, the uh, the new podcast that uh, came out uh, in January. So uh, we really had a good time with that. So again, join us on Patreon. Uh, all these other people are on Patreon. This is the Cool Guy Club, man. Really, uh, come join the Cool Guy Club. We do open Zoom calls twice a month, and they're totally free. We don't make you be a member of Patreon or anything like that, like some other podcasts do. There's nothing wrong with that, but you, you know, our way is just always totally free to come in and join and bullshit with a bunch of reptile keepers from across the country. And we do that twice a month. The next one is going to be on March 13th at 8 p.m. and it's always on Sunday night so uh so stop by and hopefully we could we could start the week off with a fucking uh with a laugh or two. We drop new podcasts on the first and the 15th of every month so if I don't see you guys on Patreon or the open Zoom call then hopefully I'll see you there and uh, we're actually uh, having a new leveling up um, episode coming out this month on March 10th where I'm actually talking to the uh, the young guns of podcasting. These are just people that I think that you should know about and I think that you should listen to. And um, it, it, we had a really we had a really good time, you know, doing this one. And it's uh, Heidi from In Blue, uh, then it's Brian from What's in Your Cup, and then it's uh, Tom Wolf from Wolfie's Royals podcast. So uh, I, that's going to be out on March 10th. So I hope to see you guys there. And um, yeah, listen, that, that's about it. It's been it's been a little busy here, man. But uh, thank you guys. I love you guys. You fucking you you you're the best fucking fans in the world because you keep coming back listening to my fucking dick and fart jokes, and I appreciate it. And I will see you guys in two weeks. Everyone talks their own shit about what kind of racks you should buy. Metal racks are great, but everyone doesn't want a goddamn seven foot high, six foot wide, 2,000 pound metal rack in their fucking house. That's a two refrigerator footprint, man. Two fucking refrigerators. Sea Serpents makes insane quality racks that could fit anywhere. They're stackable PVC racks that are living room friendly, and they're shipped fully assembled with heat tape already installed. Just plug it into a thermostat and you're ready to go. When we had the shop, we had over 20 sea serpent racks there before they ever became a sponsor of uh, Snakes and a Fat Man. I don't breed much anymore these days, but I still have a few racks here in my house, and you could be goddamn sure that they're sea serpents. Oh, and they also make hot box incubators, probably the best reptile incubators made in America. At the height of our breeding business, we had four four-foot hot box incubators, and again, I still have a small hotbox incubator here in case anything I keep actually does breed. Go to SeaSerpents.com and check out their incredible selection of PVC racks and tell Chris Nettles that the Fat Man sent you.